Um, so we're following the guidelines set forth by the governor. And initially, as you might recall, they were fairly restrictive guidelines of who can get the vaccine. So what we experienced is that uh, when not many people were eligible to receive the vaccine, there was a large demand for it. Now we've been through several different progressions and currently the governor has declared that anybody over the age of 18 is eligible to see the vaccine. And we're starting to see a leveling off of the demand for the vaccine. It is becoming a more of a level of, off of the people who, um, who want to get it because the ones who really wanted to get it initially um, got it at the very beginning when they were eligible. Um, I think the, the actually the fear and the anxiety over the vaccine has starting to decrease. And we're starting to see some of the people who initially wanted to wait and see starting to sign up to get the vaccine. And some people who were waiting to see what would happen and a little hesitant on getting the vaccine initially are starting to see that the side effects are tolerable and to see the benefits of actually receiving the vaccine. Well, I could tell you that Jefferson Parish Human Services Authority has continued to provide health care to individuals through telehealth in the health centers and actually out in the community. Uh, we have seen an increase in the intensity and duration of people reporting symptoms of depression and anxiety and substance use. We are experiencing what has been demonstrated by the CDC and the United States Census Bureau study, the Household Pulse Survey, that studied individuals from uh, August of 2020 through February 21. 2021, that individuals uh, are reporting an increased level, an increased intensity of anxiety and depression. What we worry about is that study also indicated that the number of individuals who needed help but didn't get help also increased significantly. So we're certainly available and we have experienced that. If we, if we think about the whole arc of the behavioral health needs, um, we certainly know a lot about individuals who have, just individuals who've been through a traumatic event. And we know some more about what groups of individuals uh, who've been through trauma experience. What we really don't know, and it'll be really interesting for, for us to experience is how such a large group of individuals who have been through a traumatic event for such an extended period of time are going to stop. If we extrapolate out, we know that for an individual who goes through a traumatic event, from prior studies, 75% of individuals experience a traumatic event, but only 7% develop significant symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. We also know from those studies that people with post-traumatic stress disorder actually have a pretty good outcome compared to some of the other conditions we deal with. So for individuals that experience post-traumatic stress disorder, they have uh, negative alterations in cognitions and mood. It's really difficult for them to connect with individuals, really difficult for them to connect with positive emotions or kind of stuck in those negative emotions. They also have increased negative reactivity where they're going to be irritable, angry outbursts, trouble with sleep, trouble with concentration. And they're going to have um, avoidance. They're going to try to avoid anything that's associated with that trauma and also intrusion. So they're going to be trying to go throughout their day, but those traumatic events and those traumatic memories are going to come back. So that's how an individual is affected. When we've, when we've studied groups of individuals that have been through a trauma, so after 9-11 or after Hurricane Katrina, we know that a lot of people experience post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, but not, again, not everybody went on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. We know from specifically from 9-11 that even individuals who are watching those events on television who are not near New York City, develop post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. 
and again, what we don't know, and we'll have to sort out as a community, a world, is how such a large group, so basically everybody in the world has been through a traumatic event where their life has been threatened, and it's been for over a year duration. We don't know how that's going to play out. But again, we can extrapolate from what we know about individuals who go through trauma and groups that go through trauma. But for many individuals, uh, they're not going to be able to articulate how they're struggling. So uh, if you think about how their body has responded to stress hormones elevated for about a year, they may not be able to articulate how they're feeling, but they're going to experience elevated blood pressure, increased unhealthy behaviors like excessive eating, substance use. So that's going to be a very large population. Um, as a psychiatrist, when people can articulate the struggles that they have, it's a little bit easier for us to deal with. And we have excellent treatments for post-traumatic stress disorder, um, really good prognosis, as I said before. So what I really worry about is those people who are not going to be able to articulate it and then they're going to engage in behaviors that are going to make things worse in the long run. But as people start to reacclimate and back into the new normal, um, start to get back into society, start to go back to their primary care, their uh, specialist, their psychiatrist appointments, um, we're going to see the, um, the effects of this year-long um, forced isolation. So um, not just with, um, you know, their behavioral health, mental health, but also their physical health their, uh, uh, and their chronic medical conditions. Louisiana has a strong history of serving the, uh, the underserved uh, Charity Hospital, going back to days, who have really done a great job of not only having a large hospital there, but having the outreach community centers um, and other uh, federally qualified health centers out in the community. Now, initially when the uh, vaccine was available, it was only available at the larger hospitals and larger facilities. So sometimes it's a little tougher for those from the underserved and rural communities to get to the vaccine. Uh, but as the vaccine has uh, progressed, we've seen more and more availability at the, uh, the local health centers that are out in the community. Uh, so I think that is a positive with Louisiana. Um, but the underserved community, the African-American community, the, uh, the underprivileged have a little hesitancy when it comes to the government, when it comes to the medical community, uh, and we've seen that in the vaccine uh, distribution. Um, they have a underlying fear that uh, conspiracy theory or wh whatever you want to call it, um, and then, you know, a little concern. So we've seen that hesitancy when it comes to getting the vaccine. Uh, we've seen that hesitancy initially when it came to seeking medical attention for symptoms of COVID or for seeking medical attention for other conditions because they were concerned about the, um, the effects of the virus. Um, so we are working through that as a community, as a state, as a, as a country of serving of everyone, um, those with access, those with limited access, those with resources and those with limited resources. The first thing is I have to acknowledge their, their feelings. I have to acknowledge, acknowledge the history of things that have happened in the country, such as the Tuskegee experiment um, and other experiments and things that had built that mistrust. Um, you can't just blow it off and say that's, um, that's foolish because that is their feelings and that's what they're going to go with. So you have to acknowledge it first. You have to understand where they're coming from. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you want to explain to them how this is different, how this time, how this virus, how this situation is different. Um, a lot of people looked at the vaccine and thought it was too quick, thought it came out too quickly. 
And then I want to explain to them that it was years and years of research going into vaccines similar to this um, that they were able to put together. Uh, and so that's why this vaccine wasn't really a rushed vaccine. Um, and, and kind of explain to them their fears, ex uh, acknowledge their fears, their concerns, and then explain what this situation and why it is different. But we have seen that dramatic increase in people presenting a crisis. And again, what we talked about earlier is that we don't know what the effects of that year is going to play out over the next few years. Not that they're going to play out, of course, but we are ready. We're ready to serve those individuals and prevent those deaths for certain. I, I agree with you that Jefferson Parish is really diverse. Um, from an economic standpoint, from a resource standpoint, from a racial standpoint, and not just white, black, uh, but we also Hispanic, Vietnamese, uh, and other races. Uh, and Jefferson Parish has done a good job of uh, integrating all the different uh, different uh, levels of resources, uh, economic background. You, uh, just like in Orleans Parish. Uh, one neighborhood uh, might be right next to the next neighborhood. One community is intertwined with the next community. Um, so it is, you know, sometimes it can present some difficulties of uh, meeting the needs of each individual. Um, and then with it being such a large area to cover, having health centers available close by, because with the difference in resources, some, sometimes it's transportation, um, or different things like that, uh, different economic backgrounds, um, trying to get the resources to the patient can be difficult. And the only thing I'd like to add is in your initial question, all of those were obviously surrounded by water <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. And, you know, uh, one of the other interesting things about trauma is it can be cumulative. So last year, we didn't just, you know, have a year of COVID. We had a lot of of hurricanes that hit Louisiana. So we had that cumulative effect, but that's gonna be true for anybody in any situation. If they've been through trauma before and they experience another trauma, they're more likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. So we're certainly aware of that, but I thought it was interesting in your description. Yeah, we're, we're completely surrounded by water and we're under, under sea level. Under sea level. <laughs> The only thing I wanted to add that I, I prepared ahead of time is um, because I do a lot of work in psychiatry and addiction, when we're dealing with things like people resistant to seeking uh, health care or people that are resistant to getting the vaccine, when I'm working with people that obviously need help and are suffering and are not willing to accept the help, we just really have to respect their position and we just have to listen to them where they are. So. I'm hopeful that, you know, maybe hearing Dr. Hyder and I talk about it is helpful for people. But I think the other part we need to do is definitely just listen to people that are out there struggling, respect that they may not want health care right now or they may not want the vaccine right now, and just be with them the whole time and let them know that we're certainly available whenever they're ready to be for us to help. Yeah. And then and to piggyback on that, uh, we've seen an increase in telehealth and alternate means of seeking help. And I think everyone should try to use that to their advantage and to seek help in whatever is their, you know, whatever way they're more, more comfortable. I can say personally, I, I was very hopeful when the vaccine came out and it was available as we were able to provide that to individuals. I guess I'm cautiously optimistic because of what we talked about before, knowing that we're just coming out of this and we're dealing with all the stress that we had and how people are going to be affected. So on one hand, I'm hopeful about the pandemic. I guess I'm cautiously optimistic about the behavioral health effects, the primary care effects, 
same. And I'm a, an internal optimist. So I always try to look at the sunny side of things. Um, but I am too kind of cautiously optimistic about the situation. Um, you know, uh, we are coming through, I think, to the, to the not to the end, but to um, a new age of this COVID uh, virus, um, the pandemic, uh, with the vaccine, we've seen the benefits of it. We've seen how the antibodies are stayed in the system. And we're now six months, almost six months out from the beginning of when the vaccine started to roll out. And we're seeing the, the benefits of it. Uh, we're seeing how we can sit next to each other without a mask um, because we've both been fully vaccinated and how the recommendations have been changing as far as travel and how people can now visit their loved ones. They feel more comfortable seeking care. So I think we are rolling to the end of that. Um, but, you know, I'm always worried about what's next. Um, I'm always worried about um, the long term effects of that uh, year long stress, a uh, year long of people seeking less care, um, year long effects of the virus. So cautiously optimistic about where we are with this pandemic.